Ladies and gentlemen, we'll begin our next session now. Manufacturing, in fact, has been one of the fastest growing sectors of the Indian economy. So what is really the future of manufacturing? I invite Session Chairperson Shankar Ayer, Managing Editor, India Today, to kindly escort our next speaker for this session onto the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Alan Mulali, President and CEO, Ford Motor Company. Good afternoon. We are here to discuss a very interesting subject. We just spoke about whether demography is a dividend or a disaster. And the simple answer is unless we create manufacturing jobs, it is going to be a disaster. So we are going to look at future of manufacturing. And we have uh, Alan Mulali, the best man to speak about manufacturing just now. He's the only company which didn't go to the feds for a bailout. It's the only automobile company, so he knows how to run a business in the best, best times and the worst times. A little about the subject. There are many reasons why this is the right subject at the right time in the right country and in the right place, the India Today conclave. India is the only country in the world manufacturing is growing in double digits. I'm going to be the skeptic here about all the Chinese figures. India is the only country where automobile sales growth is over 30%. India is the only place where you can sell 20 motorcycles every minute. India is the only country where 15 new mobile, 15 million new mobile phones are being bought. India is the place where manufacturers are rushing to build new world cars and which is one of the reasons Alan is here. You know Ford launched the Figo a few days back, which is almost an Indian car. We know Nissan is launching the Micra soon. We all saw the launch of Chevy Beat in the January Auto Show. India is not the center of the universe for just automakers, but for a host of other industries. It is the only country where you see the manufacture of mobile phones for less than 2,000 rupees. Makers of every possible segment from mobile phones to aircraft parts. And Alan, again, being an ex-Boeing man, you know that some of the work is happening here in India. We all know that the economic center of gravity has moved from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. What I also want to state here is that probably it is in India because he is visiting India before he goes to China. Ladies and gentlemen, be assured you are at the right place for the right reason. And we have the right person to speak on this subject, the future of manufacturing. Allow me to introduce briefly our speaker. What do you do when your car company is not doing well? What do you do when you want your car company to fly? You hire someone who used to run a company making aircraft. Now that is in my perspective. Bill Ford thought so. Our guest today has many distinctions, most of them unique. He has flown most of the people in this room, I think, on Boeing 727, 737, 747, 757, and 767. He's also responsible, some ex aviation experts tell me, for why we're not able to find enough 787 to fly on, because Alan left the Boeing and joined Ford Motors before. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hand together for President and CEO of Ford Motor Company. Not just because he was named as the most influential person, the person of the year by Aviation Week or by Business Week. Because it's the only company that did not drive to Washington to bail out for a bailout like General Motors and Chrysler did. He knows quite a bit about tailwinds and headwinds having drawn airplanes as his, part of his signature for many years. When he took over Ford, he interviewed Bill Ford first and many other ex executives. And then he came up with this famous three-point plan, which is modernize plants, switch to cars which could be sold in several markets, and third was radical transparency. 
result, within three months of arriving as CEO, he could raise $23 billion on Wall Street at a time when nobody was giving anybody the next breakfast check and at a time when auto industry was the worst place to be. Thank you. Well, how are you? I think I'm the last thing between you and lunch. <laughs> and I hear we're behind schedule. So uh, I hope uh, I can be uh, concise. Um, first of all, I'd like to just uh, uh, share with you a few thoughts about the subject, uh, which is so important to, to uh, India and to Ford and, and the world. And then I'd be glad to uh, uh, open up the uh, questions because that's usually the most uh, fun part because it's such an uh, important industry. Uh, it's the answer to uh, energy independence, energy security, sustainable growth. And I'm just so proud of the, of the role that India and the Ford Motor Company are taking on those global issues. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I've been here many times on, on Boeing airplanes. It was fun to fly in again and see all the fantastic uh, Boeing airplanes that have helped uh, link India to the to the world. Over the years uh, with Boeing and now with Ford, I've witnessed India's uh, development and its growth. And I have been so proud and pleased personally to contribute to that progress. As a nation, India has generated tremendous forward momentum, creating endless potential for our future. And because I spent most of my career building jet aircraft, I am a big fan of forward momentum. But I have also learned that once you generate momentum, you need to focus a lot of attention on steering it going forward. And as you know, and each of you would agree, this is no small task. The decision we make today will shape the future for all of us for decades to come. It's a good thing bringing people together and global thought leaders from some of the country's largest sectors across all parts of India and beyond to share perspectives, to seek consensus, and to look at the road ahead together. Congratulations to India today for facilitating such an important conversation. The invitation to join you is a real honor for me personally and for the Ford Motor Company. I'm very glad to have been asked to speak with you today about the future of the automobile industry, the future of India, and the key issues we face together as a global economy and community. As we look, together, as we look forward to the future and the challenges we face, it is important to start by coming together around a compelling vision. At Ford, when I joined more than three years ago, we also needed and wanted to come together around a compelling vision. And we found that in the nearly century-old words of our founder, Henry Ford. In 1925, Henry Ford ran an advertisement in the Saturday Evening Post. In this advertisement, he shared the following vision for the Ford Motor Company going forward, to open the highways to all mankind. Let me, let me read to you a little bit of what he wrote in this ad. Riding on the people's highway should be within easy reach of all the people. An organization to render any service so widely useful must be large in scope as well as great in purpose. In accomplishment of its aim, Ford has never been daunted by the size or difficulty of the task. It has spared no toil in finding the way of doing each task better. It has dared to try out the untried. Ford views its situation today less with pride and great achievement than with a sincere and sober realization of new and larger opportunities for service to mankind. So compelling. Eighty-five years ago, Henry Ford laid out a vision that not only guides for today, but can guide all of us as we work together to truly open the highways to all mankind. At the core of this vision is the belief that we have a duty and a responsibility to provide safe and efficient transportation for everyone. It is a vision near and dear to my heart as I have dedicated my entire 41 Boeing and Ford career to safe and efficient transportation. And I propose to you that by working together to deliver on a promise of safe and efficient transportation, we will also collectively contribute to three large and important global issues, economic growth, energy independence, and environmental sustainability. And it was true in Henry Ford's time. In the 1920s, Henry Ford set up an automobile operations all around the world. He believed that his cars should be built where they were sold so the local economies and people would realize direct and indirect benefits from job creation and employment, economic stability, and growth. Henry said that 
Since oil supplies were finite, we needed to shift to alternative fuels such as ethanol and electricity. So he invested heavily in alternative fuel research, and he was the first to introduce electric vehicles. Economic growth, energy independence, and environmental sustainability. These are big issues, and the automobile industry has a significant role to play. Let's consider for a moment some facts. As we think about economic growth, it's important to note that worldwide prospects of auto industry volume are positive, with average annual growth rate projected to be at 3.6% during 2011 to 2020. With much of China and many regions of India, particularly the western border states, in the takeoff stage of development, it is interesting to note that more than 38% of the global auto industry volume growth in the next five years is in the Asia-Pacific region. And as we dimension the challenge of energy independence, think about this. In 2008, India was the world's sixth largest net importer of oil, importing 2.1 million barrels a day, or 70% of total oil consumption. India is projected to become the world's fourth largest net importer by 2025, behind U.S., China, and Japan. And as we sit here today, India is reliant on six countries for 75% of their oil imports, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Nigeria, Iraq, Kuwait, and the UAE. In addition, as an outcome of the Copenhagen climate meeting, India committed to reduce emissions intensity of its GDP by 20 to 25 percent by 2020 in comparison to the 2005 level. This is a significant challenge with many possible solutions. For example, biofuels provide less than 3 percent of transport energy today but the Indian government has set a target of having all petrol and diesel contain 20 percent of biofuel by 2017. To support this target, there are current plans to plant 11 million hectares of trofa. Unlike other plants used to make biofuels, trofa is not a food source which lessens the impact of food security, and it can grow on arid land with little water required. And alongside these alternate energy sources, more fuel-efficient petrol vehicles, like the new Ford Figo, offer much opportunity to reduce reliance on foreign oil while also reducing CO2 emissions. All these big global issues require working together on a very large scale. These are global conversations in which each of us needs to participate as leaders and as citizens. As leaders in the automobile industry, we believe we have a role to play in the development of new technologies, affordable solutions that require less fossil fuel but continue to offer greater safety, technology, and value. And in business strategies to stabilize and grow, not just our enterprise, but the economies in which we participate. One example of, possi of the possibilities of working together is the endowment Ford Motor Company provided for two Henry Ford chairs at the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai and uh, Delhi. These chairs were for research in the area of vehicle emission and transport safety. We continue to work with students at technology institutes to provide expertise and thought leadership. The work being done through these activities will benefit not only Ford Motor Company in India, but our global society. To address such larger issues, we must come together around a plan. Having a robust plan to deal with our current reality and pursue a compelling vision is essential to our collective ability to solve these global challenges. Three, year, three years ago, the Ford team came together around a plan to become a stronger, profitably growing company by serving our customers worldwide with the very best cars and trucks. We realized our previous way of operating was not sustainable, and together we developed a plan to deal with our reality and create a viable, growing enterprise. We moved aggressively to restructure, aligning our costs and capacity to the real demand and changing the vehicle model mix. We accelerated the development of new products our customers really want and value, and importantly, we developed a finance plan to finance this transformation. That funding not only saw us through the darkest days, but allowed us to accelerate product development and our R&D efforts on the new vehicles. Finally, we decided to really work together as a global team instead of many independent operations the way we were operating around the world.